welcome. Uh, welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing our discussion on H18, an act relating to sexual exploitation of children. Um, on our agenda, it says committee discussion and possible vote. I know on Friday or Thursday when we last discussed it, people were feeling like they were ready to vote, but just wanna check in. Um, we don't have any um, witnesses today, uh, but they are on, they're available as well as counsel. So, any questions? No? Nope. All right. Then, um, so Ken, are you set with, as clerk, are you set with um, what you need for a form in terms of for votes? I have, <clears throat> sorry, I have the form right in front of me. I'm just, I, I think I just got here late. I'm really not sure of what we're doing. Okay. I mean, we're going to call a roll. We're going to call a vote. Um, yes, on 18. Yeah. And okay. then at the end of the day, um, the clerk's office, um, instead of coming to, uh, to each committee room, they actually will send an email asking if there's anything for the calendar. Um, so we'll say yes. And then, uh, but I'm not sure in, in terms of getting, well, maybe Michelle, you can help us in, or I can ask the clerk's office in terms of um, you know, getting the amendment and the signature and, and all of that that we need to hand into the clerk's office for the calendar. Right, I would have I would have you check with Betsy Ann and her okay. staff to figure that out because I'm not sure how that's all what y'all are doing in the virtual realm for that. Right, right. Okay. Um, I, I did just want to check and make sure what version you guys have for the for the strike all amendment. Okay. Um, to make sure that. Um, so you should have. I think I realized I, I'll get I'll get Ken a clean copy because I have a little bit of uh, highlighted language on a draft two point one of the strike all. Right. Um, uh, Mike sent me a. Uh, an email. I think we know what we're doing. So that's for that's for the vote part. There's, it gets a little more complicated once you get the bill ready to go. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Michelle. So yeah, it is two point one. Yep, and I'll send uh, something out to Mike and Ken right now that just doesn't have the highlighting. That way, they've got a clean copy. But I'm not changing any of the language. Okay, great. Thank great. you. Committee members, you. does everybody have 2.1 dated 128, 9.42 a.m.? I'm seeing, seeing nods. Okay. All right, well, I would entertain a motion to- I'll make that motion. Okay. And what is your uh, motion? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, I make the motion. We accept uh, draft number 2.1 of H18, dated 128-21. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, nah, I'm going to hold my tongue. Okay. Why? That's unusual. Okay. Not seeing any hands. Sometimes it's best. So, okay. Then the clerk shall commence to call the roll. And committee members, you could just say yes. You don't have to, you know, put up your hands or anything like that. Just say yes. Hopefully yes. Or just say what your vote is. <laughs> so. so we're ready? Yeah. Thank you. Paul Brown? Yes. Donnelly? Yes. Goslant? Yes. Lalonde? Yes. Leffler? Yes. Not? Yes. Norris? Yes. Christy? Yes. 
Rachelson? Yes. Burdick? Yes. Brad? Yes. All thank right. You. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, and congratulations. Our first bill. And yeah. Tom, you will be the reporter. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Definitely. Great. Great. Thank you so much. And I just got um, a bit earlier the penalties um, uh, from David Scher, so I'll send those to you in case anybody asks what the what the penalties are. Okay. And, um, sure. Um, Michelle and David will help you tremendously if you yeah. if you need it. And uh, I, I do. And and uh, I will ask. And I think I just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been great on this before. I really, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, really appreciate your leadership and, and committee. Really appreciate all of you coming together on this bill. And um, thank you, Michelle. That's great. So, okay, great. All right. Thank you. So, Tom, are you heading out to plow? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. If I may, uh, um, not discussion, but it is about this bill. I just, I just want to thank everybody that was involved, you know, uh, between, uh, you know, Marshall and David, this, to me, this, it was just really strange the way this came about with, you know, with all the back and forth, um, you know, and, and, uh, and I realized, you know, it, it, you know, depending on which side you're looking at, it's, it's not what you wanted. Um, but I, I do think that it's, uh, I do think it's a good bill. Um, you know, and the bottom line is, and I think, I think it might have been Barbara last week that kind of brought things back into focus, um, you know, as, as far as what we were doing and, and what this bill is about. And, and this bill is about, you know, it's about the kids, it, uh, um, you know, and, uh, and, and protecting the kids because, uh, you know, I got to believe, I mean, I've never seen any studies or had, it, you know, been in on any discussions on, on what happens to kids and what their lives are like after being traumatized, um, you know, with some of the things that happen, um, you know, in that, in that world that they get um, forced into. But, um, but again, I just want to thank everybody. I, I really want to thank Michelle, you know, for all the work that she did on this. It was, uh, um, uh, at times, I feel like she was a referee almost, but um, but just just a, a great job. I mean, you know, with the you know with the constitutionality stuff, and um, you know, in, in the language, just uh, I don't remember exactly what part it was, but it was you know, language. It took like thirty seconds and, and had new language that was better than what we had, and um, but just thanks to everybody, and uh, I think everybody in committee knows. Um, uh, how how near and dear to my heart this topic is and and uh it, it's just the right thing to do thanks thank you thank you coach back in okay all right great thank you so we're gonna move on to um h20 and Eric, um, are you able to do a walkthrough of, by Tom? <laughs> um, Stay later. I am leaving. <laughs> okay. Of the, um, of the latest uh, draft that we have on um, NH20. Just let me. I don't think there's a new draft, is there? Or, I'm sorry, you're right. It's, no, it's not a new draft, um, but it's the basically 1.1. It's not as introduced, so um, it would be great if you could um, if you could walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, if, you, if you can compare what's here to how it was introduced, I think that would be helpful. And do folks have it? It's on our um, committee page. Uh, if, if you go to um, Today's date, you'll see it under Eric's name. I'm just get, getting to that myself. Okay, great. And that, um, Yeah, 
is, as you mentioned, uh, Representative Grad is the is a strike all amendment. Um, I'll pause for a moment just to uh, introduce myself for the record. So this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to talk to the committee for a moment about uh, H20, which is an act relating to pretrial risk assessments and pretrial services. Does anybody not have the committee strike all amendment in front of them? That's version 1.1 dated 1-27-2021-128 p.m. I'll assume that that uh, everybody does have it. Thank you. So remember, we we uh, walked through this once before, uh, but I'm going to refresh your recollection, as we say in the legal world, <laughs> so that uh, everyone has has that fresh in their mind as you talk about uh, what you want to, what direction you want to go with the bill today. So remember, we talked generally about the amendment process, and this is a strike all amendment. So it strikes the bill as introduced and replaces it. Um, with what you would see in front of you and still contains the yellow highlighting to show what the changes are between the amended bill, which you would see in front of you and the version as introduced. And I'll mention those as I, as I go through where those changes are. Uh, so the first one you see, if you just uh, start right on page one and that's at lines nine through 13, remember this is the big picture of what's going on here is that this, the bill relates to risk assessments, pretrial risk assessments, and need screenings. And remember that the uh, after hearing a testimony from a number of witnesses and having uh, quite a bit of committee discussion about the efficacy and potential bias involved in risk assessments, the decision that the committee made was to scale back uh, how risk assessments are gonna be used and scale back uh, their authorization in the statute uh, almost entirely. Now you see that there's, we'll see that there's one way in which they continue to be used. But for the most part, what happens uh, in the proposed bill now is that risk assessments are in large part gotten rid of. So you'll see that's what's going on in lines nine through 13 on page one, that just strikes all the references to risk assessments right there. That is also a difference just to remember that was not the way the bill was introduced. As it was introduced, uh, it just changed risk assessments from being uh, mandatory to discretionary. So that was the bill was introduced. It changed a, a, a may to, sorry, it changed a shall to a may. Now where you've landed uh, in the amendment is to sort of go beyond that and not just make risk assessments discretionary, but actually uh, phase them out uh, almost entirely. So that's sort of the big change between uh, that, that the, both the bill is proposing and between the bill, the amendment that you're looking at and the way the bill was that was introduced. And that's what you see there on page one. Uh, so uh, you see some renumbering there. That's just technical to, because you're striking that whole first subdivision one. So you do some renumbering to make sure that the, the uh, numbers are now correct. Again, starting toward the bottom of the page, you'll see in subdivision two lines 18 to 19, again, just striking references to risk assessment. So that again, that's consistent with one of the two main things that's going on in the bill which is that risk assessments are being phased out. So when you see them in the statute, they're being uh, repealed. So that's what's going on there. Uh, but you keep the references to need screening because those, those are being maintained. Uh, so again, the uh, um, phase out of risk assessments is not complete. And you'll see in the next subdivision starting on line 20, the way in which they are retained. So for what purpose will risk assessments be retained? You see that uh, a judge may request one, request one um, for it to be performed by a, a pretrial services coordinator um, per, if, and this is uh, to, to determine whether the person poses a risk of flight, and this is, goes over onto page two now, if the person has been, essentially been arrested in uh, uh, lodge for 20, more than 24 hours and they're not able to post bail. So in that situation, you've got someone who's been arrested and lodged and can't post bail for 24 hours. In that situation, risk assessments are potentially retained. I say potentially because it's a request that can be made. The judge may request the boot trial service coordinator to perform one to determine uh, risk of flight. And so that's what you would have going forward as the manner in which risk assessments could still be used. Well, again, you see some language struck there in, in the second part of that same paragraph. 
uh, really just doing the same thing that I just described. It's um, uh, narrowing the circumstances under which a risk assessment can be requested in the way that we just I just described. Um, I don't know if anybody heard that. Sorry about that. That's her dog sitting. We have a dog here who's who's got a little pneumonia, but she's taking her good medication, so she's doing well. <laughs> but she has a nasty cough, as you might have just heard. Um, anyway, uh, so moving along. Um, uh, again, you'll just see as you continue down the page, all references to risk assessment are struck. Um, again, consistent with the, with the change that you're making. Then the second main thing going on in the bill, you'll see is not highlighted because this has not been changed from the bill as introduced. This is the same as it was. And this is over, this is on page two at the bottom. And this, what this does is that it's uh, essentially providing um, the ability of certain group of people to make sure that they continue uh, to have the ability to get uh, these, um, these need screenings. And uh, it's in some ways a bit of a technical point, but the idea is that uh, when you, when the legislature, I should say, uh, expanded the, uh, the juvenile statute to permit uh, people who are a little bit older to still be treated as juveniles, you didn't want to inadvertently uh, limit their ability to get need screenings. So what this language does is it makes sure that um, even those folks who are 18, 19 years old who can still now under the new law under certain circumstances be charged as juveniles, make sure that that group of people can also get um, the need screenings or the risk assessment for that matter. Um, but either way that they can, they can engage with a pretrial services coordinator just the same way that someone under 18 could uh, if they were charged as a juvenile. So it essentially just makes their treatment consistent. And that's the other, uh, the other main thing that's done in the bill that you see in line lines eight to 10 of page three, that's just a technical boots and suspenders, so to speak, to make sure that the language is consistent with what I just described. The, it just make sure that that introductory language does the same thing, make sure that that same universe of 19, 18, 19 year olds is included for um, pretrial services. And that's about it. That's the, there's, the rest of the bill, as you can see, is not highlighted, not underlined. That's really just shown for context. So um, that gives you a big picture review of what the amendment does and how that's different from uh, what H20 was as introduced. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Any sure. questions for, for Eric? Um, okay. When we last met, there was a question about um, the uh, the word request um, that the judge may request, and um, David Chair did um, check with Judge Grierson, and he was he was okay, is okay. Judge Grierson is okay with um, with um, with the word uh, request. David, I see you just came on. If you're welcome to add some comments to. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, <clears throat> David Chair with the Attorney General's Office for the record. Um, as the committee may remember, this is in fact the same draft that you had seen last week. So after some discussions, uh, there hasn't been any need to change anything. Uh, there are some tech very, like really very technical points that we talked about with respect to if the draft gives sufficient permissions for pretrial services to do what it needs to do, and we think it does. Uh, Judge Grierson did um, notify the chair in writing that he was okay with the term request as opposed to order. Uh, <clears throat> he did note that, um, you know, he said that with the understanding that risk assessments may not always be available. Um, he wouldn't have known this, but I will just tell the committee that our office is treating the, um, the language of this bill to require us to be ready to administer a risk assessment should it be requested. We don't anticipate that that's going to be a frequent occurrence for all the reasons we've talked about, but our staff will have risk assessments available, uh, you know, prepared in the file, ready to be uh, uh, given. If 
a judge does request it. So we don't. We do think that they will be all available. Um, and of course, a, a defendant always retains the right to to refuse that if even if a judge requests it. Um, so that's really the only update. It's it's largely the same as what it is the same as what you reviewed last week. And um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. I do see um, two hands. I'm, I'm not sure what order they went up in, but Coach and then Selena. David, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for your work with the um, the rest of the uh, witnesses uh, around um, uh, amending uh, the original uh, bill. You know, I think that this is much more equitable. Um, you know, as we're moving forward, and the hope would be that as we do move forward, that the AG's office and the uh, victim, uh, I mean, excuse me, the uh, uh, Willa's group uh, will be looking at uh, more unbiased uh, tools that could be used to uh, help facilitate this work. But I do want to thank you and the judge and James and, you know, the rest of the, uh, the witnesses uh, for amending it. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Okay. Thank you, Coach. Um, Selena. Um, yeah, I was listening along in the Democratic caucus today where there was some good conversation about this bill. And I think one of the questions that came up there was like, why are we retaining them at all if they have bias? And um, I would love to hear your comment on that. And just an ex and just to help us think through some of those rare instances where it might really make sense for a judge to request it. And you know, I don't want to put a lot of hypothetical too many hypothetical situations out there, but just, just sort of understanding that provision that we retained and, and where it, where and how it might come into play at times. Sure. Uh, so with respect to this bill in particular, I think, um, and I have two thoughts that came to me, one directly answer, answering your question and another little bit of a broader thought about risk assessments in general, or I should, yeah, assessments in general. Um, with respect to this bill, we did talk to a number of people uh, after the initial committee discussions. And one of the areas where uh, some folks had concerns with respect to retaining the at least the ability to give a risk assessment was in particular the potential for somebody charged with a domestic assault case and judges trying to figure out what's really going on with respect to um, you know, where people live, uh, how likely they are to return, what the real conditions are. There's concern that those are particularly tough cases to evaluate, for a judge to evaluate, and uh, they may want to, um, they may want to have that, use that tool uh, or ask that tool to be used. And the second reason was the um, one that we talked about a little bit, I think in the immediate prior meeting on this bill, which was that it does retain an avenue for a defendant to ask for one if they really want one. Um, again, we don't see that as a likely thing. It hasn't, it doesn't seem to be used much now, but that was another concern that uh, a couple folks on the committee had brought up that if it could be beneficial, there should be a pathway, even if it's a narrow pathway to getting that used. And this seemed like a way to accomplish that as well. On your first point, I just have a question about that um, because looking, I mean, just all the testimony I've ever heard about these assessment, the um, these assessment tools, is that they're really, really inadequate in domestic um, cases of domestic violence or assault, and and I note that the language that we struck in section A1, you know, when when we did have the risk assessments more in place, says the assessment shall not assess victim safety or risk of lethality in domestic assaults. So we're just, but it's, it would be really just looking at risk of, I guess I'm trying to understand why these tools would be of particular use 
in those scenarios when like everything I've heard is actually to the contrary? Yeah, well, a couple things to keep in mind. You raise an important point, and and we re we made explicit a limitation that was really only in practice before uh, in this bill, which is that these will only be used to assess risk of flight. Um, and I think the issue that I was hearing, again, we were trying to um, make sure we were addressing as many concerns as possible while while minimizing the the use of these. The, the concern that I heard was not that these could be or you know they, they can't be used to assess dangerousness or lethality or anything like that these are risk of flight only assessments and they, they won't be used in any other way um that were there won't be any other kind administered in this situation um but that those were cases where there there was difficulty understanding all the facts of what was happening with respect to uh issues that are relevant to risk of flight and so a judge may want them in that case and um, and, you know, I, I don't want to overemphasize that particular crime. That was one that I had discussions that came up in discussion where those were cases where facts are difficult to ascertain, including those that are re relevant to risk of flight. But I think the concern was uh, broader than that, that there could be other cases where uh, a judge may choose to use the tool. Um, but again, we, we envision, envision this being limited. One broader thing I do want to remind folks of is that um, risk assessments are, you know, this is worthy of a broader discussion. Risk assessments are currently used in the Vermont system um, in a much broader way than these ever were, uh, and certainly it will be now, including the YASI screenings for youth. I think there's, my sense is that among people who are practitioners, those are in fact um, useful, helpful baselines to understand what different kinds of risk really are in those situations. Um, and there's an understanding that these are imperfect tools. So I, I say that only to complicate things, perhaps unnecessarily, but just to understand that uh, we are focused tightly on a very narrow usage of risk assessments, which are we're largely, although not completely eliminating. Um, but this is part of a broader universe of, of um, of trying to assess risk of various kinds in the fairest way possible. And I think that merits discussion and understanding in, in a broader way also probably outside of this bill, but th this is an issue that's, um, that's a big one. Thanks, that's, that's helpful. All that. Great, yeah, no, thank you, Selena. That was, sounds like Good question, for sure. Uh, anybody else? I'm not seeing any other hands, but nope. Okay. All right. Great. Well, we're gonna put this one back for now. And Eric, I hope your your dog gets better, or your whoever your your friend or whoever your dog sitting for. Yes, it's thank you. It's our neighbor. She's actually doing pretty well, as, as bad as that cough sounds. Otherwise, <laughs> she's doing great. So, but thank you. I'll, I'll pass along your best wishes. <laughs> yeah. And also, Representative Grab, were you uh, wanting a clean copy, perhaps for next time? You know, because those the, of the amendment, maybe a, a clean strike call. I could send it through our editorial staff and have it proved so that you'd be ready to to move forward with it if you decide you want to go that route. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so much. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, all right. So now, committee, we're going to turn back to H87, Act relating to establishing a classification system for criminal offenses. And uh, we have a number of witnesses that we were not able to get to the other day. Uh, give folks have the bill or what they need in front of them before we before we start looks good yeah okay great great then why don't i welcome um rebecca turner from the uh defender general's office and the i think you're the vice chair of the sentencing commission as well right and uh so welcome nice to see you thank you for joining us Thank you. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, 
focused around grad. And uh, for those of you who have not, uh, who I haven't gotten to meet yet, um, I'm Rebecca Turner here uh, as um, representative of the Office of the Defender General, uh, where I am supervising a appellate attorney for the appellate division uh, that oversees um, all appeals in from the criminal divisions, family uh, divisions, clean delinquency and chins cases where I've been since 07. Um, and from that perspective, I was um, included on the sentencing commission when it was uh, brought back to life. And while I haven't been around uh, as long as some of my fellow members on the commission, um, I've certainly benefited from all the work that's come before. And so come to you uh, both from my perspective as um, a criminal defense uh, litigator, but also as vice chair of the Sentencing Commission. Uh, H87 that you have before you uh, came as part of the proposal, uh, I think in 2019 was from the Sentencing Commission relating to uh, recommendations on general reclassification of, across the board for all uh, crimes, but particularly focused on property crimes. Uh, and that work was primarily uh, handled by a subgroup of the Sentencing Commission. Uh, Judge Treadwell, I understand, uh, came and spoke with you about that work uh, last week. And I was on that subcommittee with him. And so come to you also with that background in terms of the uh, rolling up the arm sleeves hard work on, on sort of translating those recommendations into a particular category of offenses. And so here are property crimes. Uh, while I didn't speak with you specifically about this bill last session, uh, my colleague Marshall Paul did, and I understand uh, how that progressed and what passed last session is the same as before this, this committee now. Um, the Defender General's position last session, um, and it continues with this H87, is that we generally support this uh, version. It, um, it, for the most part, vastly uh, decreases penalties for uh, criminal offenses consistent with the reclassification scheme that the Sentencing Commission came up with. Uh, there were recommendations made by the Sentencing Commission for specific offenses that I and others and the um, members of the defense community couldn't support on the Sentencing Commission. And uh, those objections were shared last session. And those related to any place in the bill where the result is actually not the same penalty currently on the books or a decrease, but where the results actually increase the penalty. Uh, and so to the extent that there are still a couple, I think I found two, uh, that are still shaking out that way. And this H87, uh, the objection continues. And again, just to be clear, the objection is to why um, those penalties should be increased. Uh, our task on the Sentencing Commission, of course, was to not make any suggestions that would result in an increase in current penalties unless there was a compelling reason. Uh, and we weren't, we were not, I certainly didn't find a compelling reason to justify the suggested increases in penalties. Um, and those two continue on here, I think, primarily in the two offenses of unlawful mischief and false claims. Uh, so I just want to put that on your radar. And that shakes out to be an increased penalty than what is on the books where the value of the property at issue is more than $100,000 of loss. So we're talking about the higher end uh, theft uh, cases uh, or property cases, and that would be for unlawful mischief and false claims. Um, again, I think that is revealing a little bit of the arbitrariness and of the levels of um, property loss that were picked, particularly where it starts following and tracking the felony on uh, graduated increased classifications. And so I just want to make sure that the committee uh, sees that, that the current proposal does not result in 
uh, a reclassification with all same or lower penalties on the books, but results in two new ones uh, to the extent that I don't see a compelling justification for increasing those crimes. There hasn't been a presentation that I've heard that otherwise uh, explains that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, that such a problem could be fixed by way of increased incarceration. Uh, that is where our standing objection continues. And the only other objection we have is the proposal for a new crime. Uh, and that was uh, the organized retail theft crime um, in this H87. Again, my understanding, I, I just don't see how the current crimes of property crimes in the books can't otherwise address the, the issues there. And I think I'll, I'll, if there are other questions, any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll pause here. I know there are a lot of people waiting to talk. Thank you very much. Um, there are questions and really I want you to take your time and don't, don't feel rushed. <laughs> um, appreciate you being here. So uh, Selena and then Martin. Um, yes, I have a question, but just before I forget for the committee, I think, um, at one point when we were looking at, you know, nearly identical legislation last year, we had a really nice chart that showed us sort of current penalties and then how things change. I might be, maybe I'm imagining that, but um, that was helpful, I thought at the time. Um, so my question is really relates to your last statement and I, I just know we have heard so much in this committee and it's something I hear a lot about in my community in Burlington about the whole question and issue of organized retail theft. And so I just, and prosecutors and business owners in particularly feeling like we need different or stronger tools than we have. Um, and I'm wondering, I would just love to hear more about your perspective that the laws on the books really are adequate to address that. So if there's more you would are able to say about that, I think it would be helpful to have you on the record on in a little more detail. Sure. Um, as to your first point in terms of a helpful chart, you know, the only chart I, I recall seeing was was what came as an appendix with the sentencing commission's report. But I would love to see uh, if there was a chart uh, produced last session to guide, because it is, it, is, it is really a maze to sort of untangle. Um, in terms of your question as to unpackaging, what new does the organized retail theft crime provide that doesn't otherwise, uh, isn't otherwise covered by current statutes? I think that for me, it's helpful to look at the proposed language specifically, right? I think that what we can, presume is in the crime based on the title organized retail theft. Actually, when you open it up, it's a pretty low threshold of what could actually be um, done here and triggered. And, and I'm looking at, let's see, page 18 on my version um, is where the language of organized retail theft is. And, and as proposed here, it's, it's um, committed whenever retail theft is committed, and so it, it references back to the definition and elements of retail theft. So here's the extra, right? The extra is an acts in concert with one or more persons on one or more occasions within a period of 180 days. So to me, we have aiding and abetting, we have conspiracies, you know, we already have these inchoate offenses that you can attach to the substantive property offenses. And I don't see why that doesn't otherwise get covered here. Um, except for, I think, the opportunity to throw on some extra penalties. Again, uh, what was the mandate or certainly the project at hand before the Sentencing Commission, I certainly as a defender and see um, this close up over the years, uh, really question what purposes, what is the goal being achieved by increasing um, incarceration? And I think one of the opportunities that is presented by this project, reclassification, I think is exciting, particularly in broader context of um, trying to check disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice systems 
generally. Racial specifically has been a hot issue. And certainly that came up really in the summer of last year, pro probably, and I'm, I'm guessing after a lot of the discussion of this version last year took place. I think that to the extent that the legislature plays such a critical role in checking abuses and discretion before they happen, right? We spend a lot of time trying to understand it, proposals of collecting data, right? To understand where it's happening, seeing the studies play out in terms of racial disparities and traffic stops uh, and on and on, where I think there is such a huge role for the legislature to play in that in not perpetuating and continuing sort of this structural uh, system where disparities can easily come through is, is creating new crimes uh, to increase penalties for those crimes. Because the effect of that is to increase uh, or allow for more uh, discretion by judges, more discretion by prosecutors and police to enforce those or to impose penalties closer to those maxes. Um, and so to the extent that uh, this reclassification project allows for a shrinking, a check, right? Uh, a reorientation of what we think is a, a proportionate and appropriate penalty. And I understand, and I think it is, it is brilliant to, to, to commit to sort of looking on, on overview of big, big pullback lens to make sure that our penalties are consistent and make sense. Consistency is a, a, is, is a reason, but not just to have consistency, right? They should be proportional to what, uh, what harm is being caused and what you hope to achieve through penalties. Uh, we know that our criminal justice system has fundamental problems with disparities, going in, staying in, coming back out. All along the way, there are discretionary points, decision, discretionary decision-making points. Uh, and to the extent that this, this review of maximum penalties that are imposed on criminal offenses and new crimes that could just stay off the books because there are already crimes that exist, this is such a potent, um, this is just an, an incredible area where this committee could focus. So, you know, when you look at this and consider these things, it is easy to say, oh, the vast majority of these offenses, the effect is, is we're dropping the penalties. What's the harm that there are only two, three, a handful of offenses here where the net effect is the penalty increases where, you know, certain, certain in this instance, where certain theft value thresholds are met. What's the harm of just adding one new crime? I think the question really is, are we, are we, are we, are we keeping that entrenched system? Are we, are we, are we giving more discretion uh, that we're actually seeking to check? Um, I'm sorry, that was a very long answer to your question. No, that was super helpful and just a follow-up, maybe half question, half statement. But that, as you were talking about aiding it, sort of, sort of, there's there's tools right already on the books, like aiding and abetting and conspiracy. And so what, as you were talking about um, the potential to enhance disparities, I wondered about that aspect of things too, when you create like yet another, when there's multiple avenues to charge something that seems like that would create at, with different penalties <laughs> associated, potentially that seems like that would create more discretion too that could or bias could come into play and so i'm wondering you know in the work of the sentencing commission how much that was part of the equation is looking at are there three different ways to charge this and can we clear things up so that there's there's not such an array i can speak for the subcommittee uh, that worked on these uh, categories of offenses, and that that was not a factor in terms of how much overlap there is already, right? Um, and you're right; the, the, it is about the discretion, and it's it in this instance, it's about how many counts, how many charges for the same underlying act can the prosecutor file against the defendant. Judge Treadwell talked about how uh, oftentimes when he's presented at time of sentencing an actual plea deal, 
right? And so his discretion perhaps is, is not checked, is, is more checked or is limited because it's limited by the proposal that the parties come to him, right? Well, then the question is, is why do defendants um, plea to certain offenses? And there is where the prosecutor, prosecutor's discretion uh, and the power uh, it, it, it wields is enhanced by having the ability to pick and layer up multiple counts, uh, layering up the potential penalties with consecutive sentences, right, for the same underlying act. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, and then Coach. Thank you, Rebecca, for testifying today. Um, it's been good working with you on the Sentencing Commission. You always have very good input on these uh, issues. Um, could you comment a little bit more on, on the impact of, of raising the felony threshold uh, for a lot of these crimes from $900 to $3,000? And you could also certainly comment on the fact that the Sentencing Commission suggested $10,000, uh, but, but if you could comment on the consideration of the so-called felony threshold. Yeah, yes. Um, I think that one of the, the net effect is that the threshold amounts that were selected as a basis results in a general lowering of penalties currently on the books or the same penalties. So on one level, if I'm just looking at this, of is, is the end result good as assessed with lowering penalties? Yes. I think where the the unpacking came in and where I didn't find really great explanation for it was why those numbers, why those amounts? And it, and it plays into, and I understand there was some discussion last session between drop 10,000 to 3,000, right? And I think the same point is made there. Why 3,000 versus 10,000 versus 20,000? Uh, where are we seeing the numbers? What are the values of, of, of losses suffered? how much, you know, to the extent uh, we could find useful data where we see how many crimes are being committed involving X amount of thefts loss, uh, that would have been helpful. I, I, we, we didn't have that kind of data. And I know that there are folks from CRG here who can and speak more to that. I know that, that there was, um, that the prosecutors pulled from other jurisdictions to get examples on, on what threshold amounts we should use. Again, except for the fact that, oh, someone else is using it, it there wasn't an explanation that, that there, there was a connection to what we were trying to achieve and the amounts, right? Um, and as you, and again, there, I just wanted to, to raise to this committee's um, awareness that when we start comparing to other jurisdictions and just use and see their labels as felonies and misdemeanors, that Vermont is, I don't know, the only state in the country, but certainly uh, in the minority in terms of labeling our, we, our misdemeanors are up to uh, two years. And whereas other jurisdictions, it's one year and up. So you'll see references to, oh, this one's punished by a felony and these other jur jurisdictions and for us only a misdemeanor, but in fact, the time maximum time imposed is similar. So that complicates comparing apples to oranges in effect. Thanks. Okay, uh, Kurtz. Just, just a quick reference to everyone. Um, the report that uh, Selena was referring to uh, was the um, sentencing commission report that we got last year. Uh, and within that report is uh, an incredible amount of really uh, interesting information to help uh, clarify a number of the points that were, were made. Uh, the survey um, that was referred to, uh, some of the charting uh, of the differences um, uh, between uh, them, uh, it's it's there. It, it's it, it's a lot to digest, but at least uh, it's good evening reading, right? <laughs> if I could just follow up with what Coach said, um, 
under my name, <clears throat> there is also an updated uh, grid given some of the changes that we made relative to the um, Sentencing Commission recommendations. Uh, I have to double check to see if it's the one that actually matches what we finally passed out last year, but I think it is. I just haven't stepped through to, to double check, but you can find it under my name. There's a few documents there that are all relevant to, to this bill. Great, thank you. I think I got everybody. So go ahead, continue, please, thanks. I just wanted to make a, a final point, which is uh, thanks for the reference to the Sentencing Commission's report. In there, there's an appendix on page nine that includes sort of uh, a, a list of what the property amount thresholds are in other states. But one of the interesting bullets there, particularly in, in the context of the discussion here of 3,000 versus 10,000, uh, the, the commission's recommendation was to have a $10,000 uh, limit. And I understand that the committee has uh, the recommendation adopted last year brought that down to 3,000. The effect, of course, meaning that more uh, lesser amounts, 4,000 now or above 3,000, will be punished at a higher rate. I just want to point out that the appendix here references um, South Carolina, where when they changed their cutoff amount of 10,000, uh, or just generally change and increase the, the property value amount as a threshold, that no increase in property crime was observed. And um, I think that hasn't been said yet, but at least that's important to see that it hasn't jeopardized or, or triggered an increase in crime. Um, and again, that I think is consistent with what we understand from the studies, this was the recidivism studies, the deterrence studies, that just because you have a lengthy maximum sentence on the books doesn't, ha uh, doesn't um, encourage uh, crimes. And so just wanted to put that appendix on your radar. Thank you. That's yeah, yeah if, I, if there are no other questions, I don't have anything else to, to add, I think. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. I'm, I'm looking around, not seeing any other questions. So, well, great. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye. Um, James Pepper. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, for the record, uh, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And um, so H87, um, as you've heard, is largely a straight translation of a recommendation from the Sentencing Commission. Um, I don't wanna to be too repetitive. Uh, many of you have heard extensive testimony on this bill last year, and you've also heard from the chair and the vice chair of the um, Sentencing Commission this year, as well as Judge Treadwell. Um, but I would uh, like to just briefly discuss the origin and justification for this bill kind of from a state's attorney's perspective. Um, so the primary task of the sentencing commission was to develop a classification system that categorizes uh, all of our criminal offenses based on their maximum penalties. So that's what you have before you in section one. Um, but the commission was also asked to look at um, existing statutory penalties um, and what their actual going rate, their prevailing average sentencing practices are in the state and the effective uses of criminal punishment. And they were supposed to lower, uh, unless there was a compelling rationale to raise, but to lower um, penalties uh, based on these existing uh, statutory um, or the going rate. Um, so this is important work for a number of reasons. First, um, this system that we have before us in H87 um, categorizes sentences by the gravity of their harm versus a kind of more ad hoc approach of our current system that can be more susceptible to the emotions at a given time or you know a kind of desire to send a message that might exist at a certain point. And I always think about um, the trafficking offenses in Vermont carry a 30 year or a million dollar penalty. Um, no one has ever, 
been sentenced to the maximum penalty. I think, you know, we've heard over time that they, that the average is around seven years for trafficking and that, um, you know, no one's ever gotten that million dollar fine. So um, it's important to kind of rationalize what's actually happening with uh, what our, what our sentences are in Vermont, our potential sentences. Um, I also think about some of the disparities that exist between or historically have existed between crack cocaine and powder cocaine federally and the kind of huge detrimental impacts that those have led to. Um, and also just in categorizing crimes in, into this structure, we were able to identify for the legislature certain irregularities that have developed over time. Um, specifically, one that we came across was non-consensual sexual assault carries a maximum of life, pres uh, life in prison and in, under the indeterminate life sentence statutes. Whereas if you, the crime of non-consensual sexual abuse of a vulnerable adult, which has the exact same elements, except the only difference is that the victim of the crime is a vulnerable adult, I actually carries a shorter sentence, a 20 year sentence. So it, this bill, while it doesn't totally eliminate the possibility of uh, creating a, a penalty that's out of sync with other crimes of similar harm, it at least you know, starts to kind of shape the legislature's thinking when they're thinking about crimes, creating new crimes, creating new penalties to associate them with other crimes that have a similar harm. Um, and it kind of sheds a spotlight on some of these outlier uh, sentences. Um, again, just, you know, this was an important project because uh, a recommendation because it really is adjusting our sentencing, our sentence ranges to reflect actual sentencing practices. I mentioned this before, but the heroin trafficking is a good example. Um, and you know, this is also helpful for prosecutors um, and judges because there really is a dissonance that occurs when the public sees that the maximum penalty for heroin trafficking is 30 years, and yet a prosecutor is recommending maybe seven years or five years. And, you know, the public seems to think, well, you know, why, why wouldn't the prosecutor just ask for the maximum sentence? But really, it's just this helps kind of to rationalize um, and kind of reduce this kind of public perception that, um, that seeking the maximum penalty is, is a possibility. Um, and then um, most importantly, um, I think that what this bill does by grouping um, crimes by the harm that they that they incur or the property damage, um, it de-incentivizes or it just um, it, it's it furthers the um, kind of truth in sent truth in charging and more geographic consistency in charging. Um, you know the the classic example that you know I raised last year and and we talked at length in the sentencing commission is there are a number of overlapping offenses where the same conduct could be charged several different ways. So the one that we look at is fraudulent use of a credit card, um, let's just say $1,000, or false pretenses of $1,000. False use of a credit card is a one-year or $1,000 penalty. False pretenses of $1,000 is a 10-year uh, or $2,000 penalty. The only difference between the two crimes is with the credit card, you have to prove that the fraudulent instrument you use was actually a credit card. So there's an additional burden of proof in the lower crime. So you see, so you see very few charges for credit card fraud or fraudulent use of a credit card. You see when people are actually fraudulently using credit cards, you see it often charged as false pretenses. So this eliminates that kind of, um, kind of sentence-based charging decisions. Um, amongst the state's attorneys and leads to more kind of truth in charging, I would call it. So um, we are generally supportive of this bill. There's the one major point of disagreement that the state's attorneys have is, with, with, is the same one that we had last year. It's the automatic classification, which is um, the section on page three, beginning on line 13 which just essentially says by July 1st, 2022, all of our current crimes will be categorized based on this classification structure. And um, with respect to the property crimes, I don't think that's all that controversial. Um, I think that uh, 
you know, these, these crimes are, you know, mostly for the most part, property crimes are um, not being sentenced anywhere near their maximum penalties. And I think that this proposal does a good job of, you know, even raising the, the felony threshold, which hasn't been adjusted. And I think, you know, it's currently $900, hasn't been adjusted for retail thefts, for instance, uh, hasn't been adjusted in over a decade, maybe 15 years. And, you know, there's actually a subsequent portion of the report, which uh, from the Sentencing Commission, which says that all of these property crime thresholds should be re-looked at every couple of years, uh, maybe with the help of JFO to adjust them upward for inflation. Um, but when you get to some of the more serious violent crimes, there are outlier crimes with penalties like seven years or 15 years or 25 years or 30 years that don't fit squarely into the tiered structure that is being created. And so they're going to have to be dealt with legislatively. I mean, I know there's a provision in the transitional section that says that unless otherwise provided by law. And so I, I just, the legislature will likely have to deal with how to categorize those crimes. And, you know, we're talking about first degree aggravated domestics, lewd and lascivious with a child, some of the most serious crimes that we have. And I think, you know, given just the, the Zoom legislature and the inability to kind of really, I mean, the Sentencing Commission hasn't met in person um, since March and uh, of last year. I, I think that, you know, to really fully flesh out how these crimes should be categorized, it makes sense not to put a deadline of automatic transition um, for those crimes. But other than that, um, we are, the state's attorneys are largely supportive of H87. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I have a few questions, but I'd like to start with that transition period. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Sentencing Commission, if I'm not mistaken, has recommended last in the report in November how to address those outliers that you just spoke about. Isn't that the case? Uh, am I misremembering? The, I forget if we've done, well, no, I think we have done the sexual crimes. I, I mean, there are, but there are again, um, some legislative choices that we right. put into those reports um, for, I mean, they're, they're strict policy decisions and, um, you know, they're not really, the sentencing commission other than, some of the members aren't really capable of deciding what the maximum penalty should be. And I mean, it's, so they, they've presented the legislature with choices on some of the more difficult ones. So, so now the uh, onus, I think the onus with having this transition period in the bill last year was to make sure the sentencing commission uh, addressed those uh, particular crimes. Uh, now, you know, perhaps have this transition period in there to give uh, the legislature a boost to make sure that they address this before the transition period comes into effect. Because we do now have the recommendations. I know there are a couple of competing recommendations from the uh, defender side and the prosecutor side, but we do have those. And, and certainly that's something that's high on my agenda for once we get away from remote uh, to have a bill that that puts that forward and addresses that. So I still think having the transition period in there, again, it's, I understand your concern and, and I understand the concern with making sure the legislature gets this done, uh, but this doesn't go into effect until July of 2022. So there is quite a bit of time and we can also give the legislature a little bit more time if, if we haven't dealt with this by then. I, I just see that and maybe this is not a question. I apologize. I'm kind of uh, pontificating on that particular provision right now, but it certainly give you an opportunity to, to, to speak to what my uh, view is on this, that this, this really is to provide the incentive that we need to, to get the rest of these crimes addressed. And maybe there's nothing more for you to say on that, but uh, let me, if you go ahead, if there is, otherwise I have a couple specific questions. I, I just, uh... <laughs> Only to say that, uh, you know, I'm looking at the crimes that don't fit neatly within these tiers, and they're ones with um, very, uh, you know, dramatic impacts on victims. And, I, you know, it just seems that uh, if, I mean, if, if this, if we're meeting remotely, you know, throughout the rest of this year and potentially into next year, then I just... 
the state attorneys just have some concerns about having anything happen automatically without a pre without a legislative kind of action, you know. Um, but uh, I mean that that of course you know is I understand the need to kind of have some encouragement, some some deadline, you know, to in order to act uh, to help motivate action. But it's it's just one that the state attorneys would prefer not be in the bill. Right. So let me uh, turn to the, the areas that uh, the Defender's uh, General's Office has had uh, issues with, and if you could address them, and I'm trying to see which ones those were. Unlawful mischief is one, and false claims is the other uh, that Ms. Turner, Turner raised. And I wonder if you can address why you think this bill is the appropriate way to address those two crimes. Well, if we're going to create a classification system based on the amount of harm or property damage, it doesn't make sense for the state's attorneys to have certain exceptions to that, which honestly are crimes that are overlapping with others. I mean, you know, credit card fraud, I know is slightly different um, than fraudulent, you know, for fraudulent uses, but uh, honestly, like, if the property damage is the same, it makes sense to me. And someone's using a credit card; it makes sense to have that charge be what is that, what the con reflect the actual conduct. And if that requires increasing um, a penalty, um, I think that that sort of consistency um, across all of the classification. I mean, it's the underlying motivation for a classification scheme is to add some consistency to Title Thirteen and. Uh, title 18 and 23 and then to have all of these exceptions I, you know I don't see the real purpose in in doing this if we're gonna you know have it apply to all crimes except for a handful of ones that really were probably the product of negotiation years and decades ago and probably aren't all that relevant um, this you know they just haven't been updated they haven't been looked at for for a number of years so, so is it safe to say that you know, the compelling reason, as you saw or see this, uh, is the need for consistency um, uh, along around these crimes? And truth in charging. You know, if someone is using a credit card fraudulently, then I think that that should be charged as fraudulent use of a credit card, not as false pretenses. Do you, do you have any uh, comments on the uh, organized retail theft uh, new crime uh, that Ms. Turner also talked about? Um, well, it, if I recall correctly, that came from the Chittenden County state's attorneys after speaking with the retailers association and the small business owners in their community. And really it just came out of a, a, what, what they were seeing on the ground, which is, you know, folks going on kind of a, you know, over the course of, of, you know, months just use, you know, just going from store to store and using the same kind of distraction techniques and then, you know, people making off with merchandise. And I think that uh, that was a, a crime, that was a, a crime that was identified, not, and I think it is separate from either accessory after the fact or, or, or the, our accessory crimes, but um, it's about kind of the aggregated charge. It allows for kind of It'll, I mean, it allows to enhance a penalty, um, right? But I, I will say that overall, all of these crimes have drastically reduced penalties by jumping that, um, by increasing that felony threshold from 900 to 3,000. And that one of the end results of that is that it's making a, the vast majority of cr property crimes that we see in Vermont, um, presumptive diversion crimes, expungement eligible crimes, um, divert deferred sentence eligible as well. So um, I don't, I mean, I, I think that for that specific crime, um, it makes sense to listen to the business community that's, that's really saying that this is a problem that we're seeing. And honestly, $3,000 worth of damage for a small business owner could be devastating. So that, that's my kind of last question or issue if you could address. So why 3,000 versus 10,000 versus 900 versus 20,000 for the felony, so-called felony threshold? Well, uh, as I've noted a couple of times, I think um, the 
kind of current $900 threshold, especially for retail theft is <clears throat> certainly outdated. I think almost all the state's attorneys agreed that um, it's one of those, it's one of those thresholds that should be considered every few years um, and, you know, inflated to match or increased to match inflation. And I think, uh, again, I would just note that uh, on the sentencing commission report, there is a recommendation that that threshold be increased. I think it was used JFO to kind of index um, inflation from the prior three years and increase the uh, threshold. Um, and so I think that 3000 is a, is a good um, level. And I, and I would say that when a prosecutor is looking to develop a plea uh, bargain and someone's, you know, stolen, say, $10,001, and they're looking at a felony, um, they're probably not going to jump down to a misdemeanor, which would then be kind of deferred sentence eligible or diversion eligible um, for that kind of damage. But at 3000 there's, a, there's, you know, there's a much more, you know, it's much more rational to think that a prosecutor might be able to jump down. So I, I you know, 10,000, 10,000 was a placeholder number. I know that that's probably going to be a controversial thing to say. I have checked in with committee C 10,000 wasn't some magical number that, you know, the, if you look at the recommendation, there was 10,000, a hundred thousand, a million, you know, it was just factors of 10 or uh, factors of a hundred um, to, for the various levels uh, of property offenses. I think a lot of folks assumed that that would be subject to legislative debate and not a just straight translation from the recommendation. Which, which we certainly had last year. So, right. So, and we could still have it again this year on where we land. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Cannon and Selena. Did I just hear Pepper say there's there's like two different sets of crimes here? Like we're we're dealing with um with like property and stuff like this, and then I heard the sexual sexual stuff, and I can't find it on here. Is that what I heard? Do you should I answer that? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so the sentencing commission um, was tasked with reclassifying all crimes. That includes sexual crimes, fish and wildlife crimes, um, property crimes, assaultive crimes, uh, motor vehicle offenses. And so um, what they what they did was they broke out into subcommittees and they worked on each category of crime um, in turn and made recommendations kind of on a rolling basis uh, to, the, to the judiciary committees. And so what this, uh, this bill, H87, encompasses the first two recommendations from the Sentencing Commission. The first one being um, to create that tiered structure. That's the felony A, B, C, D, E, misdemeanor A, B, C, D, E. That's the tiered structure that you're seeing. And then the second step is to fit the existing crimes into that tiered structure based upon their current statutory penalty, but then with a kind of veneer over it of what's, what are people actually getting sentenced at? What rates are they actually getting sentenced at? And so to lower those crimes into, you know, let's just say heroin trafficking, 30 year penalty, that would be a class A felony. But if we're seeing that actually for heroin trafficking, most people are getting seven years, then it might drop down to a class C felony. Um, so, the, the, so the recommendations that you're looking at are, the bill that you're looking at has the recommendations around the tiered structure, and then it has the automatic classification or the classification of the property offenses. And I think what you'll look at next are the sexual offenses and the assaultive crimes. And then the, to kind of just round it out, you'll need to do the drug offenses, the motor vehicle offenses, and then all other, all other crimes. So real quick, Kenna, it's not in this particular bill. We didn't put that recommendation as far as sex crimes into this bill. Uh, that would be a future bill, presumably. Okay, so thanks. So if I understand this correctly, your concern is when this bill 
goes into effect if it passes because um, we haven't done enough due diligence on uh, on studying it uh, all together in the house. So our concern is when you you have this provision that says by July 1st, 2022, all crimes will be categorized into this tiered structure unless you decide otherwise, unless otherwise provided by law. And so you see that the tier structure has, you know, uh, life imprisonment as a maximum fine as a class A felony. You've got 20 years maximum penalty as a class B felony. You have, what is it, 10 is next. Um, but you have a number of crimes that just fall outside of those, outside of those tiers. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, there's a number of, like, lewd and lascivious with a child is a 15-year penalty. So under a, under a straight classification scheme uh, based on the transition language, you know, there's going to have to be a decision point. Does that go up to a 20 year felony maximum or does it go down to a 10 year maximum? And um, I think under the straight transitionary provision, I, I don't know exactly where it would go, but the idea is that um, that's a decision that this committee and, and the legislature writ large will have to make. Is, is that going to be considered you know, a class B or, or, or a class C or some other class. And, um, you know, for the property crimes, it's not quite all that difficult, but for some of these other crimes where there are, you know, very traumatic situations that have happened and, the, and the, they are designed to deter a very specific type of harm, I think that'll be much more difficult to classify those. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Thank, thank, thank you. So, so, uh, Madam Chair, can I ask this question? Can th these are two different crimes, and I heard Martin say what he said about about a different bill or something. But when so is the sexual in these more critical crimes, for lack of a better word, are they going into another bill, or are they all going under this general general change that's going to be July of twenty two? Um. Martin, do you want to, I think I know the answer, but Martin, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the intention is to, is to ha uh, have additional, uh, an additional bill or bills that take up the other recommendations of the sentencing commission. Uh, that being uh, the sex crimes, uh, the crimes of violence, uh, and uh, those we already have recommendations. Uh, and also down the road, uh, motor vehicle crimes or uh, offenses. Just one second. Uh, and uh, drug crimes. Uh, so, so yeah, that is the intent. And and I can I know that last year there was a lot of uh, committee discussion of whether to keep this transition period in uh, or not. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier uh, today, that. Uh, part of the rationale for doing so was uh, to make sure that the that, uh, sentencing commission was going to continue to give us these recommendations. And, and it's, it's a new, probably a new debate or a new discussion we should have again, whether that transition period should stay in because we have additional recommendations now. But yes, the idea is that this sets up the whole system, the categorization system, and it categorizes the property crimes uh, in part, it shows how this is going to work. Uh, and, and there was discussion of whether just to have one huge bill that did this with every crime that we have to deal with, that's 840 some crimes, and really decided that it made more sense to get it started with this and take uh, it in more manageable bite-sized pieces, so to speak, because there's gonna be a lot to do with each of these categories of crimes. And it may have just been too overwhelming, I think, to have it with one bill covering everything. I don't know if that answered the question enough for you or not, Ken. Uh, a lot better for right now, thank you. Okay, um, see Selena and then Kate, and then we will take a break. Um, Thank you so much. And I think some of my questions were answered. I really had the same question as Martin about the just knowing, you know, not to beat a dead horse, as the saying goes, because we 
we did have a lot of discussion about this last um, biennium, but knowing that the state's attorneys were one of the folks who really advocated for lowering that threshold, felony threshold level, um, I wanted to hear more more thoughts on what why y'all think that's still important. And I just will add um, that I think one thing you didn't know just to check in about it was when you said that for the sentencing commission it was the 10k it was a placeholder it i also was under the impression that it was a little bit derived from the results in south carolina was where they enacted that felony threshold and didn't see an uptick in criminal activity was that not a was that a factor in the sentencing commission's recommendations or um okay. around that number so the the felony thresholds in south carolina i just i have it here it's um Sorry, it's not 10,000. I mean, the highest felony threshold in the state or in the United States is, is 2,500. But um, again, you know, you have to take into account some of the um, issues with uh, our felony, you know, fel misdemeanors being two years in Vermont. But um, no, South Carolina raised it to. So it's not the, fel I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's not the felony threshold, but it's the, the what, it's just the, the p associated penalty it, of a 10 year maximum. They made tied a 10K to a 10 year maximum penalty. So I guess I somehow thought that there was more of a, that that was like more of a model because of the evidence around it for- Well, and you're, you, you're right about the evidence, generally speaking. We've seen, I think a number of states um, raise their felony thresholds over the years and we haven't seen a subsequent increase in crime. So yes, um, that that is definitely true. I think there's 20 states that have change their felony threshold. Sorry, I'm looking at a, a chart here um, from the Pew Charitable Trust, which is actually included in the Sentencing Commission's 2019 report, um, which I can provide to Evan um, and have him post it if that would be helpful. Um, but the, the, the real, I mean, again, like the felony threshold has not been raised in I think 15 years. Um, and you know it's nine hundred dollars uh, for most crimes, and you know I think that that is something that needs to be looked at every couple of years um, to think about this. But ten thousand dollars is a pretty significant jump from nine hundred to ten thousand, and would come encompass I think ninety. It would encompass the vast majority of property crimes uh, in the state, and I, I just think that. I mean, the state's attorneys and, and others feel that it's just that, you know, that that would be a devastating amount to uh, most small businesses and retail organizations uh, to lose that kind of, um, to, to have that kind of theft happen in, in their stores. And so again, like it's, uh, it's really just the state's attorneys felt comfortable raising it, but, but they just, their 10,000 just seemed to be, would put us way out of sync with the rest of the states. Okay, that's helpful. And then I just, I didn't know if you wanted to comment in more detail about the question of, you, you started to a little bit, but about the question of the, um, the new retail theft crime and why something like eating and abetting, and, and maybe that's a conversation for another day to really dig into like comparing you know, I'd, I'd be interested in comparing that crime to some of the other tools on the book in more detail, but I don't know if you wanted to give us more analysis now while we have you about why you think some of those other tools are inadequate. Um, and I would be happy to kind of 
have that conversation more in depth with you know um but you know this it's not the organized retail theft to me is is, is more not about the kind of two people acting in concert, although that's an important aspect to it. It's more about the aggregation over a number of months. And I think that that's where we're seeing a lot of, you know, I mean, this concept was one that was brought to us, I think, you know, there was a bill, I think three years ago that did this exact same thing. Um, And it came from kind of small business owners uh, just saying, you know, there's, there are, you know, these, groups of folks that, you know, distract our client, our, our, our employees, and then they, you know, and someone else is kind of running off with uh, a bunch of merchandise. And, and so it's, it's this kind of acting in concert, but then aggregating it over a couple of months is, is the real concept there. Um, but I'd be happy to kind of think about how accessory or conspiracy crimes might uh, cover some similar ground. I think that would be a good a good exercise for our committee to dive a little deeper into that if that if there's time but thank but thank you for your thoughts Mm -hmm. it's it's really helpful thank you okay kate and then after kate we'll take a break go ahead kate thank you yeah i know i know i'm hungry so i appreciate my committee members patience uh so i just had a question um you know, we, you use the word harm a few times uh, that part, part of what we're trying to do here is, is um, find something that reflects harm that's done. And I guess, you know, in thinking about the property value aspect, and I actually, I think I'm, on, I'm hearing you now sort of talk about this from the perspective of small business owners, um, kind of getting at my point, which is, slash question, um, how are we assessing harm when we're looking at like property value um, in association with a crime? So right now what I'm seeing in the bill is that the sentencing is just directly related to like the value of the property that's been impacted in some way. Um, But in my mind, just thinking about this concept of harm um, and certainly from like a restorative perspective, the value of a, property that's being impacted doesn't necessarily reflect the harm that's being done to the owner of that property. And in fact, sometimes you might, so if, if I were to be working with a homeless person who had one thing to their name and that were stolen from them, the harm arguably done to that person is greater than a massive amount of property being taken from a Walmart, for example. Um, and so I guess I'm just curious how those conversations are being had um, as we look at sentencing and, and and just acknowledging what you're hearing from small businesses, which is like when we just look at it in terms of cost of, of property, it's maybe negatively impacting smaller businesses and um, lower income folks who are the targets of theft. It's a great question. Uh, I would say that um, our criminal laws are imperfect and, um, you know, they certainly need to have some kind of baseline, uh, you know, consistency around them um, so that people aren't being treated um, differently for similar conduct. Um, We do have in other areas of the law, uh, things that take into account, um, you know, the harm to the victim. Uh, You know, I know, for instance, um, restitution applies to uninsured loss. So, you know, a big company that has, you know, proper insurance and loses, you know, a lot of merchandise uh, aren't gonna, they're not gonna get reimbursed for their, they'll only get reimbursed for their uninsured loss, um, for instance. Um, You know, the kind of harm that might befall a small business as compared to a big corporate retailer, you know that that kind of that kind of harm can come out through our victims advocates and through our and at sentencing. So you know a judge or a prosecutor um, can you know try and really think about what uh, what's what's going on um, with the victim and try and you know craft a sentence that you know it, and it could be a reparative board sentence. Um, it could be an, a totally alternative justice approach but it can take into account um, some of the differences and harm to the individual victim. 
but for the purpose of classification, I mean, it's just, it's an, it's imperfect, but it, it is a kind of one way to look at how crime should be categorized, um, as opposed to looking at their current, just classifying based on their current statutory penalty to really look at, you know, try and, you know, add some consistency around just focusing on what exactly, what, what the exact property value of the damage either or of the damage done or the property stolen is and, and categorize based upon that. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks. Is it possible, so, is it possible if you ask a quick follow up to that, just, uh, just sure. to, be, before we lose Pepper on, on this? Yeah. So, so the felony threshold of three thousand dollars, if if presumably more crimes that would have been charged as a felony threshold would be charged as a misdemeanor threshold, does that open up the avenue? for diversion to restorative justice to more people where that harm uh, can be addressed? All, all of these crimes are, all the property crimes are diversion eligible. Even the felony um, level? Even the felony, even the felony yeah, okay. diversion and Tamarack eligible. It's really just, you know, you created presumptive diversion um, where a prosecutor will uh, defer someone or send to diversion someone, um, unless they state on the record why diversion would not serve the interest of justice for any crime that's expungement eligible. So um, it's any misdemeanor that's expungement eligible. So uh, these are presumptive, you know, the, the misdemeanor level is presumptive diversion, but all, fel all property felonies are diversion eligible. Okay, thanks. Great. So I think we do need a break. James, um, did you have more testimony that no? No, I, I didn't, but I'm happy to come back if, if you if you ever need me for this. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's come back about five minutes after three and um, try to finish our witnesses if we if we can um, need a hard stop at 345 because a number of us have have more meetings this afternoon. So, okay. Thanks so much. Looks like most folks are back. Okay. So I realize we still have um, three witnesses and we may not get through everybody, but, but as um, testimony so far has shown is we do need quite a bit more time um, on, this, on this bill. So uh, just wanna put that out there to our remaining witnesses that um, please don't feel rushed to testify to everything that you have on this bill. We certainly will be revisiting it. Um, so why don't I start with Falco, ACLU, thank you. Hello, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to testify to you all on this bill. Uh, so in essence, H87, as you have already heard, is in many ways a rerun of a piece of legislation that passed out of this committee last year after some pretty significant discussion on a number of issues. So um, we're gonna be going through some of our thoughts and concerns about the bill, but largely say we are supportive of this piece, le piece of legislation. I was also very appreciative of the Defender General's office that they went first and uh, you know they broke a lot of ground and, and laid tracks for me uh, because our testimony very much reflects the testimony you heard from the Defender General's office. So. I think that might actually make things go a little bit quicker because you've already discussed many of these points um, in the previous uh, testimony. So I, I think in terms of starting on this bill, I wanna say one of the reasons that we are supportive of this legislation is what it would do to decrease the uh, incarceration, maximum incarceration times as well as penalties for a number of property crimes across the board. And as we look at trying to end mass incarceration in this country. Sentencing reform is one of the most effective tools that we have to do that. Um, and what I mean by that is over the last couple of decades, over the last number of decades, we saw across the country significant increases in both the prison population as well as sentence lengths. And luckily here in Vermont, we've been making a pretty concerted effort to turn back um, some of those changes and to create a prison system that's more fair, just, and rooted in community-based solutions. So to give you an idea of how these changes in sentence links have impacted the prison population, both here in Vermont and across the country, if you look at our prison population, um, it rose by 363% from 1990 to 
from 1980 to 2009 and peaked at 2,200 people. Uh, if you look at our population today, we're down to about, I think it's 1,275 approximately. So there's been a lot of really concerted work by uh, members of this committee, members of the legislature uh, and others to safely reduce that prison population. And this is another step importantly in that direction. And that, during that same time, if you look around the country, prison populations in states rose approximately 222%. And when the studies have shown that that increase over that period of time, almost half of that increase in population can be attributed to increased sentence lengths. And that from 1993 to 2009 alone, sentence lengths increased by 33%. This is a general trend we saw in legislatures across the country, increasing sentence lengths, which then led to increased uh, amount of time that people were spending in prisons, also increased prison population. This is something the ACLU uh, is working on in state houses around the country and nationally. And we greatly applaud the work of the Sentencing Commission to bring forward these re recommendations uh, because we know that increased sentence lengths are not really effective. And most uh, severe sentences are often necessarily punitive, have diminished returns, and do not effectively deter crime or decrease recidivism. So uh, for example, the National Bureau of Economic Research found that sentence, sentences longer than 20 months had close to no effect on reducing recidivism upon release. And lengthy sentences often do not prevent or control crime and may in fact res result increased recidivism. That incarcerating people for longer times might not have the effects that we we're actually looking for. And so I did submit um, some written testimony to the committee um, referencing where I'm getting some of these statistics. So I think that should be up on the website. And for those of you uh, who were in the committee last year, you have already heard me give this speech. So this should be um, somewhat old news. And on top of that, we've also seen that people effectively age out of crime as they get older. Um, as people get older, they are less likely to, uh, to commit new crimes when they are released. Also, we have to think about the impact that increased sentence links have on people outside of the, the criminal justice system, and especially people who are directly connected to those who are incarcerated. And as we think about what's happening here in our state, there's about 6,000 children in this state who are directly connected to people who are currently incarcerated. So with the longer we ask someone to stay in prison, that can have a direct impact on communities and others. Many of those are caregivers, and that's something we wanna take into consideration as well. On top of that, you all should know that as you are looking at reducing sentence lengths, Vermonters are supportive of these efforts. In a poll that we did last year, um, looking at criminal justice reform generally, and then specifically at sentencing reform, 70% of Vermonters responded they support reforming Vermont sentencing laws to reduce sentence lengths consistent with current research and best practices. So all that to say, we are supportive of all the portions within this bill that reduce maximum fines and maximum imprisonment sentences. Uh, we would echo the testimony provided by the Defender General's office that we are not supportive of those areas where fines and fees increase. Uh, I understand the concerns put forward by the, the state's attorney's office uh, that was balancing that consideration on the side of consistency, but we would rather balance it on the side of reducing sentence lengths. We know that generally sentence lengths overall are too long and that we shouldn't increase any sentence lengths without strong justification. And that's the charge of the Sentencing Commission and what guided these recommendations. So. We would uh, second what the Defender General offered on that and are not supportive of areas where fines and fees increase. In terms of the felony threshold, that we are highly supportive of the language in this bill that would raise the felony threshold to $3,000. Um, we were also supportive of the Sentencing Commission's recommendation that this be raised to $10,000. Um, and in part, this is because the research shows that these raising of felony thresholds does not result in an increase in crime. Uh, Attorney Pepper referenced a study that was submitted by the Sentencing Commission from the Pew Charitable Trusts. Uh, this was released in 2016, and it had three major findings, which I wanted to share with you all. One, that raising the felony threshold has no impact on overall property crime or larceny rates. Two, states that increased their thresholds reported roughly the same average decrease in crime as the 20 states that did not change their theft laws. And three, the amounts of state felony threat, the amount of a state's felony threshold, whether it's 500, 1,000, 2,000, or more, is not correlated with its property crime and larceny rates. So, th what we're seeing here is that as these felony thresholds increase, we're not, we're generally, these states saw a, a correlating decrease in crime that 
folks across the country saw in states where they did not raise their felony thresholds. Uh, this also leads to our uh, opposition to the inclusion of the new crime of organized retail theft. Uh, just as a matter of principle, the ACLU does not support the creation of new crimes, enhancements, or penalties uh, unless it is absolutely necessary to protect public health and safety. And don't believe that in this case, this has been shown to be something that's absolutely necessary. As we've heard from the Defender General's office, there are other ways to charge these crimes, and we think it could lead to unintended consequences um, due to how that language is structured. And you know, thinking about situations where someone might be involved, as we heard earlier, someone might be providing a distraction of some sort, but then would be, by providing a distraction, they could then be charged with a felony, you know, a higher level of theft um, than what they actually committed. So generally, as a principle, uh, I don't think it's all that surprising that the ACLU does not support the creation of new uh, crimes, and so are, are not supportive of this portion of the bill. Um, looking at the other elements, um, I, in my testimony, I didn't speak to this, but we are supportive of the transitional uh, provision found within this bill. I think, as you've heard, this is something that's going to be important to make sure that the legislature keeps moving forward with this effort. We think it is essential that we continue to look at how to reduce um, sentence links across all categories of crimes. And by putting this provision into statute, one, that creates more impetus for this body and others like the Senate uh, who heard this bill and did not fully take it, out, uh, take it up and consider it last year to continue moving forward with these efforts. This is not, these are not always easy discussions as you have seen and you will see moving forward. But by putting in place those provisions uh, which would require crimes to be uh, categorized within this, uh, this schema, if you will, and essentially round down uh, those crimes that we were not able to have a specific discussion on. So we would be supportive of this going forward. It allows time for future legislative discussion and debate in 2021 um, beyond what is happening this year um, and would be supportive of keeping that within the bill. Um, so I think that is all I have to offer on the bill today, uh, but we'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate your testimony. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, but I'm gonna give people time to either. Oh. Okay, thank you. I think, oh, I'm sorry, Ken. So a small business owner could go and and the way this law is written, and I'm a small business owner in case anybody forgot, could go and be ripped off 10,000 bucks and it's like there's no restitution, there's no nothing and hopefully I can absorb it and move on, correct? I mean, in terms of the restitution that might come from an individual who is charged and convicted with these crimes? Sure, basically, I, we're, if we change this to $10,000, um, they can get it, they can, a lot of this is going on already. They're, it's already well organized. They know how to do this and it's only getting worse. And, and I'm gonna suffer the consequences or forget about me, a lot of business owners, they can't, they can't absorb $10,000 worth of loss. I don't think I was for this last year and I'm definitely not for it now. So in terms of that, I think that would be an individual provision to be worked out within the sentencing of each individual case based on ability to pay restitution. Um, and I think that would have to be on a case by case basis. I, I don't think I can say you know, blanket statement about how that would impact everyone. Within the bill is drafted, the felony threshold is, is not at $10,000, it's, it's at $3,000, which is lower than what the Sentencing Commission recommended. And, and I do believe that this bill passed out of committee last year with a, with a unanimous um, approval. I could be wrong. Uh, there might've been some holdouts, um, but I do think there was pretty thorough discussion around how this would impact folks um, and a number of these different considerations. And I think that's why the committee last year actually revised the bill as introduced and lowered that felony threshold hold from 10,000 down to 3,000 because there was more, there was concern about folks, especially small retailers. Okay, thanks on that information. I wasn't ex as experienced then, I guess. 
Thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I just wanted to add that this doesn't change any of anything regarding requirements for restitution, uh, Ken. It doesn't affect that at all. Uh, so I just want to make that clear. If somebody steals that much, generally restitution is, is uh, part of, of a penalty uh, for property crimes. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Anybody else? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, good to see you. Okay, so now we're going to turn to Robin Joy and Karen Gannett. I'm not sure. I'm used to seeing you seated at the table side by side. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Good yeah, afternoon. As, I, as I said, I have we have a hard stop, so um, but certainly we'll we'll have you back. Okay, I you know we may be able to get through this. I don't think we have. I, Robin's piece is a little more complicated than than what I'm going to talk about, but I'll be fairly quick. Okay, all right. Thank you. So you're welcome. For the record, I'm Karen Gannett. I'm the executive director of Crime Research Group, and with me today I have Dr. Robin Joy, who is our director of research at Crime Research Hello. Group. And I just wanted to um, give you a little background. I know I haven't met a lot of you yet, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here to meet you. We're a small nonprofit research center. We do criminal and juvenile justice research. Um, our primary work is through a contract with the Department of Public Safety doing providing services as Vermont Statistical Analysis Center. So we work for the state of Vermont primarily under that contract, and we provide a, um, quite a few different services at no cost to the state other than through this contract. So we can provide data requests. Um, if someone wants to know the going rate for sentences, you can call us up or send in an email to us and we can tell you what the going rate for specific sentences are. If you have any issues that you'd like to have us provide technical assistance on, we can provide technical assistance at no cost for a variety of different issues. And we work with federal and state partners on developing research studies on issues that are important to the state of Vermont. And a couple of the ones that we're working on right now, um, we are looking at equal access to alternative programs and how it affects um, communities of color and the rate of incarceration for the state of Vermont. We're looking at racial differences for victims in Vermont. And we're working on a project right now that's about law enforcement and mental health. And then we also do work outside of our SAC contract. And so for example, we have we are partners with Center for Crime Victim Services on a human trafficking grant. A couple of our recent technical assistance projects, we worked with the National Center, National Criminal Justice Reform Project on data integration and research. And then we analyzed 1500 surveys that the Social Equity Caucus developed and sent out to the across the state of Vermont and needed some assistance in, in analyzing those surveys. So years ago, I'll just tell you a little briefly. So I, we added a couple handouts to your um, site. Um, so there's the Statistical Analysis Center facts. There's a sheet on what we, what we do and who we are that I just went over briefly. We also provided a sheet that talks about what a data request is and what research is. A lot of people wonder, so if we're going to ask you a question, is that research or is that just asking for some data? So it just gives you a little bit of a, a snapshot of what's considered a data request and what's considered research. We also provided um, the Act 61 reclassification of the criminal code final report from 2015. So I just wanted to give you all a little bit of history on how this reclassification came into being. And this was a group that started back in 2013, 2014, and has since evolved to where we are today. And it's been a huge body of work. During that time, one of the things that Robin provided and that we did as a technical assistance piece is she developed a spreadsheet that has all the crimes in Vermont that are punished by fine only. 
and that's on our website, has not been updated since 2015. So, so keep that in mind, but it gives you a really, really good idea of what's punished by fine only. And she also put together a spreadsheet that for crimes that have not been charged in the past 10 years. And some of those are anachronistic crimes and some of those are crimes that you still wanna keep on the books in case, because they don't happen very often. But for example, one of the crimes that um, could pop probably be repealed is defacing a butter crate. That is still on Vermont's books. And so it gives you a really good idea of some of the crimes that um, are in the books that haven't been charged and, and to take a, take a look at those. And I think this, the Sentencing Commission and one of their subcommittees is gonna be looking at both sets of crimes. The last piece of work that Robin put together was to take a look at all crimes in Vermont and the actual sentences that have been given out. And that is the last handout that is on your site and it's sentencing data by offense spreadsheet. So she did a side by side with um, the sentencing commission's recommendations and the actual penalties for the cr same crime. So those are, are side by side. And with that, I will pass it over to Robin to describe that to you. Okay, thank you so Great. much. Great, hi. Hi Robin, welcome. Hello, thank you. And I apologize for not being able to do video, but that's just a thing I can't do. Um, so hi, um, I'm Dr. Robin Joy and I'm the Director of Research for Crime Research. And um, so I think that this document that I'm going to talk about is the document that you all were referring to earlier. Um, and I sent it to Mr. Bailey also in an Excel spreadsheet this morning. Um, because I think I had better eyes when I wrote that last year. Um, and some of that stuff was really small, so I put it in the Excel spreadsheet. I could uh, expand it and see it better. And what you have there is the um, recommendations from uh, the Sentencing Commission on whether it's going to lower or raise the penalties from where it is, um, and what the current sentences are uh, for the crimes um, updated through 2019. Uh, I want to um, caution uh, this committee and, and, and legislators in general about, um, although I have 2020 data, I don't know the effect that COVID has had on our processes yet. And so I don't like to use 2020 data um, until we figure out what really has happened. Um, and so, if we go back in time to look at before COVID, 2019 is our last full year of that. Um, and so I'm still okay saying not to update it to 2020 because we don't know what effect COVID has had on sentencing arrest patterns, et cetera, et cetera, yet. I'm still analyzing all of that. So uh, it's through 2019. Um, something else that I provided to the committee um, last year, and I will redo if this is something that is of interest, is we have access to another data set that's called the National Incident-Based Reporting System. And this data set gives us a really rich look at crimes and who's committing them and the circumstances of those offenses, et cetera. And so uh, the last time I appeared in person, um, I was able to get you um, the amount of retail thefts or property crimes in general that were over $10,000 in value and under $10,000 in value. Um, and I could break that down farther by county, by town, um, by type of location on whether it's a retail store um, or another private business or a home. Um, so I can do that for any, you can write the, the dollar value of the property are in the data you tell me the breakdowns of the numbers that you want to see. If you want to see 3,000, 10,000, whatever, I can do that for you. Um, and I can update that table as well. Um, so that's some of the data that we have and that we've, we've contributed to help uh, understand uh, how crime and sentencing work in Vermont. And I was wondering, I guess at this point, since I can't see any of you, um, if there's any questions. Thank you, Robin, uh, giving folks a chance to put their hands up or uh, Martin, there you go. 
So uh, a quick question for Robin. Did, are you able to look on uh, a screen at the documents that we have up? Yep, yep. Because if you I look at that. A under my name, I just uh, I had uh, Mike Bailey load up a document that I'm pretty sure you provided last year. <clears throat> and and it doesn't, it, it, it looks at the average and maximum, I believe, property values for various property crimes. It could, if you could just look at that and just confirm that that's, that is something that I actually, or is that not something? So I, I can go on your website, on the, on, on your committee website. I'm not on the Zoom yeah, thing. The, the committee website okay. on, for today's testimony uh, under my name uh, has a document okay, that on. this was loaded up and I just wanted to Confirm if that's. Yeah. Let me just documents. Oh, it's February already. Property amounts. There you are. Yep. So that was yep. That was the one that I did. Um, and so I can actually. This was through 2018. I can add 2019 data if that's helpful. Um, yep. So that's what that was. That was the average property value um, in these incidents that were reported, and then the maximum um, property value that was reported in that data set uh, for that year. So as a follow-up, so yep. mm -hmm. the follow-up, is it possible to find out how many of these crimes in these years uh, had a property value of between $1,000 and $3,000, or is your data not fine to yes. that? No, no, I can do that. I think that would be helpful. So between 1,000 and 3,000? Yeah, I mean, that, that essentially tells us the number of crimes that would be a misdemeanor that would currently be a felony. Sure. Yep. No, that would be helpful. Thanks. And does anyone else want any other information along with that? Like, um, Selena, I see Selena's hand up. Go ahead, Selena. Yeah, I'm just noting, I don't know if other people are having this too, but I'm I'm not able to open the document that you submitted. So I'm, a, I'm struggling a little bit to know what more I might ask for. Um, and I just wondered if that was unique to me or if that was a, other people were having that. Um, which, which document is that? Uh... So if you, under today's agenda, under Robin's name, there's a document that says property crimes data. It looks like it's a PDF file, but none of my PDF crimes data. So applications will open it. Is, is that the spreadsheet that tells you the going rate, uh, Robin? If that's, uh, that's what I think it is, yes. Let me just okay, go back so, to that. So um, if, if you want to go to hmm. either my name or last Wednesday, Okay. Under, under my name, the I same thing. Believe. Well, I thought it was. Yeah, I'm actually having it. The error on my name as well. It shouldn't actually be the one. If it's the one I sent this morning, it's actually an Excel spreadsheet and not a PDF, unless it was turned into a PDF. Yeah, I wonder if that's the issue because it is. It's it's showing up as a PDF. I wondered if that was it because yeah. it's showing up as a PDF. I thought I thought I had so okay so so it's actually not under that date it's under Monday date uh, H87 sentencing data by offense spreadsheet uh, so you yep. can see that uh, and I'm, so uh, just to be clear that that data comes from our court data and so what that has is it has your um, and for some uh, basic demographics about the person, such as uh, the age and uh, race of the person and the sentence, what the original charge was, what the final charge was. Um, if it went to one thing I, I realized during the, the conversation that I have not yet provided to this committee on this topic and, and, can, and will add to something um, is that I didn't tell you how many of the cases have been sent to diversion. Um, and I do know that. Uh, so how many property crimes, for example, uh, so if, if somebody would find that helpful, I can add that to something somewhere um, uh, for you uh, and go by crime by crime and how many are disposed of at diversion. Um, 
And then the NIBRS data has a whole bunch of other data that's associated, uh, and that includes the time of day of the offense, the the um, the relationship of victim to offender, the demographics of the victim, the demographics of the offenders, um, whether somebody was using alcohol at the time of the offense. So it's a really rich data set, and it's that data set that I drew the property values from. Uh, it tells me what was stolen and how much. And that how much isn't, hasn't been proven in, in a court of law. It's just what I tell the police officer when they arrive in my best faith estimate or what the officer's best, best faith estimate is. Great. So I wonder, if Robin, if you can kind of, if we have time, I guess we still have time, if you could kind of just go over a, an example or two to tell us what, the, what we're looking at as far as you know, the sure. I'm, 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 my head is sideways because the document is sideways. <laughs> yeah, that's why I sent the um, the, the spreadsheet this morning. Um, so uh, because it's also um, I used a different computer program to get the answer for you than Excel. So I pasted the the image from the other computer program in there. Um, mm -hmm. I also want to remind you, um, and I'll send out that link as well, that I, that website that I created for this committee and for this purpose is still up, um, where you can select the crime that you're interested in and the sentence you're interested in, and it'll give you the distribution of all the sentences. Um, so I'll send out that link too, so you can uh, play with that. But um, if I start with um, what on my spreadsheet is, the first one, which is credit card fraud, um, the offense name, $50 or less. It gives you the statute. Um, the current penalty is six months of the $500 fine or both. The proposal from the Sentencing Commission was that it followed the tiered proposal, um, and that was at the time um, based on the property values and uh, the, um, the property values uh, superimposed on the schedule of a, B, and C, D, and E felonies, et cetera. Uh, the notes, this was, I did um, at the request of the Defender General um, and C Subcommittee C, uh, the, is whether the proposal is going to result in less time or more time. Um, and in this case, for under uh, $50 or less, uh, it will, re will result in less time. And then if you go over to the current sentences, and this is the part that's, you know, I had better eyes, I think, when I wrote it, um, you can see here that um, I gave you the types of sentences that were imposed, the average minimum in years and the average maximum in years. And then if it's a split sentence where a person does some time inside and then the rest of the time on probation, the way the sentence is given out is they are given a certain amount of days to serve. So if we take this example, for example, um, oh, that was bad language. Um, we have five records here that were sentenced. So five charges were sentenced to a split sentence. Uh, the, the average amount of time to serve inside was about 33 days. And then they would have um, about a quarter to three months to uh, six months in um, a probationary period on top of the 33 days. Uh, there were four people or four charges that were sentenced to deferred sentences, and they were deferred for uh, an average of one year. Uh, so this tells you, this gives you the, you know, the kind of range of sentences that people are currently being sentenced to um, mm -hmm. for all of the crimes that were, were listed. Great. Thank you. Sure. And would you like me to add the diversion, the numbers sentenced to diversion here? Or the numbers uh, deferred, sorry, uh, not sentenced, sentenced to diversion? I think that would be, yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm seeing, yes, please. <laughs> okay. Seeing heads okay. down. I will do that, sure. Great. And anything else about the circumstances of the offenses? Um, so that's the NIBRS data. Like, do you want to know where the offenses are happening? Yeah, I, some I have, of property offenses. I have one other yeah. question. Do, do you track at all uh, restitution issues? Is that in any? I know whether restitution was ordered. I don't know whether it was paid. Okay. I can tell you whether it was ordered. I think that that's helpful as well. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. 
Okay, um, see so one more hand and then we'll, we will need to, um, to wrap this up. Ken. Can we also find out how many people uh, went to diversion and then ended up committing another crime? Is there statistics no. on that? Um, <laughs> no, that's a, that's a research study because then I'd have to pull everyone's criminal histories. But I did do a study on that. And it turns out that um, diversion is wildly successful for a certain group of people, largely first-time offenders. Um, in fact, uh, we found that they did better with diversion than if they had gone through the criminal justice system. Um, there was a group of offenders who were not well suited for diversion as it was constituted, and those were people who had lengthy criminal histories and perhaps some other issues going on that diversion just was not at the time able to handle. But we did do an evaluation of the diversion system, uh, and it was I, I, I have um, evaluated quite a few programs in Vermont, and I have to say the diversion program for first-time offenders was one of the most successful programs I have ever evaluated in Vermont. So I will say that. Could, could you most people know? that go to most people that go to diversion or are sent to diversion are first-time offenders, correct? In that study sample, it was that has been uh, you. The, this legislature has actually. Um, you guys have expanded it, so I'd have to go back with a with a calendar and figure out when my study ended and what you've done to expand it. Um, but uh, yes, uh, you know those people. It can be first time offenders. It can be you know first time. It could be the first time you've offended in three years, right? Um, we were basically looking at the first time offenders as a separate class of people in that study. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and actually, mm -hmm. um, we can. I uh, have the Attorney General's office in, in terms of diversion, and they have a lot of numbers on that as well. So, um, okay. Can we so, get that report? Is it possible to get that report sent to us too, Robin? The study yeah, that you mentioned? I can do that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so Robin, any, um, just for today, um, closing remarks, and um, certainly we'll have you back when we, uh, when we take this up again. Uh, no, I have no closing remarks. And if you guys have any questions, you can just email me and I'll add it to the list and and get it done for you. Great, great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, sure. everybody. Thank you all. And uh, any, oh, uh, just Maxine, oh. could we um, work with committee assistance just to get um, Robin's documentation reposted in its Excel form just because I found it hard to look at it sideways. And yeah, it open Mike it as a PDF and yeah. it's like such yeah, a rich data set. Yeah, I, yeah, Mike has reached out to IT to oh great. To, yeah. Okay.